Hello, I'm Daniel Simpson, and I am the author of The Truth of Yoga, which is uh, subtitled A Comprehensive Guide to Yoga's History, Texts, Philosophy and Practices. Um, and that's what it is. It's an overview of how yoga has developed over the centuries, from its earliest origins way back in the distant past to what it's become today. And if you were to ask somebody who doesn't necessarily know so much about yoga what it's all about, they'll almost certainly say, it's bodily contortions, it's uh, making shapes on a mat. That's certainly in the modern era what yoga has become for, for a lot of people. Um, but it's obviously about a lot more than that. Um, and otherwise there wouldn't be a book about those things which I had written. Um, so uh, in answer to the first question that uh, the Boulder Bookstore have, have posed me, um, what inspired me to write the book, um, I wrote it for myself primarily uh, in the first instance. This is the book I wanted to read when I was starting out with yoga practice uh, with lots of questions that I didn't know how to answer. Um, you know, where did yoga come from? How, how has it changed? Why do these texts that I look at not necessarily sound like they're talking about what I'm doing in my weekly yoga class? Um, so what I've tried to do is um, bring to bear the benefits of my 20 years of exploring this material for myself <laughs> um, uh, and also my training initially as a, as a journalist. I used to work as a foreign correspondent for the New York Times and before that for Reuters News Agency. Um, and then more recently as, as a, an academic, I've studied yoga at grad school and uh, therefore have you know, quite a, a good insight into the latest scholarship on yoga history and philosophy. And uh, I've tried to marry all these things together with, with you know, my love for the yoga tradition um, and uh, the great benefits I've derived from the practice of yoga, but to understand those um, in terms of how the tradition explains itself, which is really through sacred texts for the most part. Um, and so I, I, I've tried to look at those from a practitioner's perspective to try and explain what yoga means, why people have practiced yoga, um, and, and how that's changed over time, but also to keep a little bit of scholarly detachment um, and uh, you know, question some of the stories people tell about the history and philosophy of yoga, and particularly in the modern era, because a lot of what's said about yoga can be misleading. So my attempt with this book is to bring clarity, to shed a little bit of light on these subjects, um, and hopefully to make it fun. <laughs> this book is not a very thick book, so um, it's designed to be read easily, um, and it breaks the subjects down into, into you know, bite-sized, accessible, uh, digestible parts. Um, it's divided into to four sections, the earliest history of yoga, um, the classical period, the, the texts that people have most often heard of, the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, the Bhagavad Gita particularly. Um, and then the third period is sort of evolution of yoga into something a bit more like what we know today, physical practice, um, working with the body, uh, which is heavily influenced by tantric philosophy. Um, and then in the modern era, how yoga has changed. So there's those four phases of development. And in each of those sections, there are maybe 25 very short chapters. So you can dip in and out of this book or, or you can read it cover to cover. It's hopefully entertaining enough to do that. <laughs> A book about philosophy can sometimes be very dense. My attempt here is to make it come to life. So the next question I was asked is, how long have I been working on the book? Well, um, I suppose in some ways it's been gestating since I went looking for a book like this and couldn't find one, um, which now is yeah, 15, 20 years ago. Um, I was first inspired to write it though about three years back, um, particularly when I was teaching. I teach yoga philosophy at the Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies and uh, people are always asking questions um, and uh, they're most often asking me, you know, really, especially when I teach on yoga teacher trainings. Um, to recommend a book that sums everything up, <laughs> you know, a, a nice overview, straightforward guide to things, and I couldn't find one. There are many fantastic books about very specialist subjects, particularly academic books. They're not so easy to read. There are lots of books you can go to a yoga section um, that, uh, yeah, I guess, are more about, they tell us more about us than about yoga. <laughs> they tell us about modern priorities. Um, a lot of yoga translations are, are very much spun in a way that sounds appealing to a modern audience rather than really dealing with the, uh, the tradition on its own terms, bringing it to life um, you know, in, 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 in the way that it speaks uh, timelessly in, 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 in the ancient language of Sanskrit. Um, and the problem is we're often reading yoga texts in English uh, that have been um, creatively interpreted to make them sound uh, 
very much in keeping with what yoga has become. And so I've tried not to do that. I've tried to explain the uh, different tradition in the way that it, that it brings itself to life, but at the same time to make that accessible. Um, so yes, this is really is the second part of the question asked, is it the product of a lifetime interest in yoga or a more recent interest? I mean, it is kind of both because it's grown out of my teaching in more recent years, but it's, um, it's really the fruits of, of, of my own personal dedication to studying yoga and to practicing yoga and uh, trying to explore for myself um, what it means. Uh, and that subject is so vast that the answer can't be put into words. Um, and yet <laughs> I've had a go. Um, so what kind of research did I do for the book? Uh, well, I, I kept reading really, and uh, I kept asking questions um, of my teachers, uh, of, uh, of the texts and the traditions, particularly you know, asking questions of some of the stories we're told. Um, it's often suggested that yoga is timeless. The, the ultimate state of yoga is beyond time and space. It's beyond the mind, it's beyond language, but uh, texts themselves have been written at different times and the practices they describe have, have changed a great deal. And a lot of ideas have been exchanged between traditions. So uh, one of the, uh, the other questions I was asked is, you know, what, what's been the, the thing that surprised me the most when writing this book is the discovery of just how uh, intermingled the history of uh, yoga and particularly Buddhism is. Um, texts that we think of in, in, in the yoga tradition as particularly yogic, uh, especially Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, uh, are very closely influenced by uh, the Buddha's own teachings. They've come from the same place. It's not that one has sort of stolen the other's ideas. It's more that they share a common source of inspiration. And uh, it's only really through the academic study of yoga history that I became really aware of that and, and, and started to understand um, how rich this process of exchange has been and how it's continued uh, really over, over, over a very long time, thousands of years. Um, and so when we think of you know, the modern process of how yoga has developed, ideas going backwards and forwards from east to west, it's a similar process that's underway. And uh, you know, obviously this brings up a, a question which is addressed in the book about cultural appropriation. Um, but I think it's worth also understanding that there is a long history of cultural exchange and a lot of, a lot of good things develop that way. And really uh, the question is, um, are we engaging respectfully with tradition? Are we uh, interested in that, first of all? I mean, there's no obligation to be, but I would strongly uh, suggest that it's worth uh, dipping into a book like this to understand how what happens today and is called yoga relates to what's been called yoga over, over the years. So that really answers Another question, which is, you know, what is the benefit really to studying yoga history? Um, is, 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 is there some reason why we all ought to do it? Um, as I said, really, it's not obligatory, but uh, if you're curious and you'd like to know um, why historically these things uh, first came into being, uh, what they've been at different stages of yoga history and, and how that might relate to what we do um, so that we can maintain some sort of a connection to tradition as you know, yoga continues to evolve in the 21st century, um, then you know, I think it's, it, it's interesting to study history. And um, a lot of what's often presented as yoga philosophy really is the history of yoga. It's the articulation of what yoga means at different times and uh, the forms that it takes you know, are very variable. Um, and so if there's one thing that I think everyone should know about yoga, to answer another question, um, it's really that for most of its history, it's meant meditation. So that really harks back to my, uh, my response about Buddhism and yoga being so interrelated. Um, this physical practice, you know, it, 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 it's been there in the background. There's also a long history of ascetic practice, um, you know, really uh, trying to transcend the body by beating it into submission, doing things like holding your arm above your head for, for years and maybe never even bringing it down. Um, the Buddha tried that sort of stuff and said, you know, that's extreme, don't need to bother. Um, and slowly over the history of yoga, uh, those extreme tendencies got modified, um, particularly by tantric philosophy. Um, and the book looks in, in detail at how yoga became a more physical practice. But for most of its history, it was meditation that was the, the ultimate aim. So even when more complicated postures are taught than just sitting still, as I am kind of now while talking and waving my arms around, <laughs> uh, the idea of those practices is, is to make it easier to sit still and to really just sort of slip into uh, this timeless state beyond the mind. Um, and there were also early physical practices that don't involve moving the body around so much. They involve working with energy within the body, particularly with the breath. 
initially, um, and then later with some complex visualizations as well. Um, and those were the, the real physical practices for a lot of yoga's history. It's only, it's only really in the 20th century that the practice of postures have been seen uh, yeah, as, as an end to them, unto themselves, um, rather than a means to a different end, which was absorption in meditation. So another question, uh, has yoga been helpful to you during the pandemic? Um, it's been an enormous source of solace, to be honest. Um, firstly, because, you know, I live a fairly hermit-like li hermit -like life at the best of times. Um, I have been in my yoga cave um, teaching over the internet a lot, um, and I've had to somehow keep my spirits up. I usually spend time in a room with other people and uh, enjoy the exchange of information and energy together. Um, and that's, you know, it's still there through a screen, but a lot of screen staring, a lot of questions about, you know, where everything's going, obviously, like everybody else. Um, and I think what yoga enables me to do, um, as anybody who's you know, dabbled in it might have found out for themselves, and certainly uh, meditation will, will really teach you this, it's possible to be okay with things even if they don't feel great. Um, it's possible to sit with them. It's possible to allow them to be and uh, to step perhaps a little bit back from this obsessive involvement with our story um, of whether things are pleasant or not, whether we're happy or not, whether we've got what we think we need or not. Um, and that's really the, you know, the ultimate truth of yoga is that it can free us from suffering in this way. It can show us that we're not what we think we are. We're not the contents of our thoughts. We're not our ideas about ourselves. We're not what anybody says about us. Uh, we're able to just witness all of that arising and passing away. Um, and therefore there's a, a much deeper contentment that comes from, in a way, accepting the world as it is in the first instance, which doesn't mean necessarily being passive. Uh, it can be a good pre prerequisite for taking effective action. <laughs> Certainly there are yoga texts that talk about that, the Bhagavad Gita being one. Um, so I found myself going back to these yoga texts in this year um, and really trying to draw from them life advice, uh, how we can live well today. And uh, there's a lot of that in my book, but uh, I think my next book is going to be uh, yeah, a much more practical guide to you know, how, how, how all of these rich and varied ideas um, can change our lives right here, right now, in very straightforward and accessible ways. Um, it's just about how we relate to our experience in each moment. So um, I suppose I should give you a taste. <laughs> can I read a short passage as the final question before, uh, before, we, uh, before we wind up? So I thought I'd start by reading the very first, first page or two, just so that you have a sense of, of how it begins, how my involvement with these ideas began, and you know, why I've written the book and, and what it might do um, if you were to pick up a copy. So when I first started practicing yoga, I knew very little about where it came from or its objectives. Neither seemed all that important. It was enough that it made me feel calmer, more content, and less depressed. Going to classes got me absorbed in complex shapes, distracting me from my unease with strange instructions. I felt newly connected to previously alien parts of my body, from the big toe mound to the armpit chest. I enjoyed getting bendier and breathing more freely, but after a while, I wanted more. Some of my teachers liked quoting from texts such as the Bhagavad Gita and the Yoga Sutra, yet as far as I could tell, these had little in common with what we were doing. They barely mentioned postures, and they talked about concepts that I struggled to grasp. Having fondly imagined that yogis in caves had performed the same practice for thousands of years, I was confused, and the more I read, the less I felt I understood. There were many different versions of yoga, and some of their philosophies seemed contradictory. I'd already encountered this with practice. Uh, each method that I'd tried had a rival idea about why it was right. However, most teachers said the aim remained the same, which was vaguely defined as union, liberation, or awakening. And most ancient texts said these goals were attained by renouncing the world. And now that neither sounded appealing, nor what we were doing on plastic mats. Over time, a few things became clearer. Popular books often blur the distinctions between different systems, but there has never really been any such thing as one true yoga. So the first truth of yoga is effectively that. 
Uh, the practice and the theories behind it have evolved, becoming combined in a variety of ways, and none of these is necessarily truer than others. Each makes sense in context, but there is no obligation to pick one text or one form of yoga and uncritically follow whatever it says. We're free to ignore what might not seem relevant to us now, but that makes it important to know what traditional teachings say and to distinguish this from how we interpret them. So that's really the aim of my book, to, to, to make the rich and varied yoga tradition accessible, um, to enable us uh, you know, as modern practitioners to have a, a personal relationship with it that means you know, we don't have to assume that we should take it all on board and find this one timeless truth of yoga, but instead for ourselves can be inspired by something about the tradition of yoga as it's developed. Um, and that it's okay to leave behind what doesn't sound so relevant. And you'll see if you go on and read the book that there are, there are some pretty funky things that uh, we're probably quite lucky that have been discarded over the years. But ultimately, really, it's, you know, it's broken down into these accessible little bite-sized chapters for a reason. Um, they're like, um, I've described this a couple of times, as, as, you know, the periodic table of the elements of yoga, the different sort of raw materials from which people have built philosophies, built systems of practice um, in different ways, in different contexts. And we're doing that for ourselves now in the 21st century. Um, and we don't have to take somebody else's pre-digested compound. We're able to take these elements and see how we might make our own yeah, modern version of something that is in its own way timeless and yet isn't. It's always been something particular in a time and a place. And what it is now is up to us. And so hopefully this book will uh, enable you to have, as I say, your own relationship with the history of yoga um, and at the same time uh, some way of anchoring what happens today, tomorrow and into the future in all of the wonderful things that have gone before. So uh, that's probably enough for now. Um, if you'd like to find out more, my website is danielsimpson.info uh, and uh, also I'll be launching a course to accompany the book at truthofyoga.com. So uh, you can go to either of those sites if you'd like to read a little bit more. There are some excerpts there um, and I hope you'll feel inspired to pick up a copy. Um, so thanks for listening and uh, thanks again to the Boulder Bookstore. Bye for now.